Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. And today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite uh, friends, favorite artists. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the work of Paula Modersen Becker. And she is one of the great German artists, great German expressionist artists. Um, a, a major innovator in modern art and um, an early innovator in avant-garde art happening in Paris as well as in her native Germany. And an artist who was um, partly forgotten for a long time uh, and has been um, re-embraced by the art world, but also partly because she died at a very young age, at only age 31 years old, and yet produced a ton of artwork during her short career. So I'm really excited to take a look at, at this artist. I'll just mention right off the bat, since people might be wondering, the, the original painting, which was recently purchased by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, is a much more narrow painting than the one that we're going to do here together. Uh, so just out, of, just out of total transparency, I used Photoshop to uh, add areas to the painting on the right and left so that it would fit on one of our 9x12 size canvases. Uh, but I don't think it's ruining the, the, um, the overall integrity of the piece. Um, I think that this is certainly one of her most well-known artworks, especially now that the Museum of Modern Art purchased it, so I felt like this would be a good artwork for us to focus on of all of the many beautiful work she's done. So let's, uh, let's look at the plan for today's episode. What we're going to do is we're going to get an image on the canvas. This one's relatively easy to sketch out if you wanted to try doing that. But of course, there's my free drawing course here on YouTube, which you can watch right now if you want to watch it right now. The link is in the description below. And then you could learn how to sketch this out all by yourself without using the free template, uh, which I'll provide. I'll show you where to find that in a moment. So uh, also then we're going to stain it with some color as she would have done herself. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, her biography, um, her tragic end of her life, and all of the wonderful, incredible work that she was able to create, uh, and, and the many firsts that she um, uh, did at, over the course of her short career, because she was, you know, did some of the very first things in the history of art that are, ver that are worthy of mentioning that, that we sort of take for granted today. Um, then we're, maybe we'll do a little bit of underpainting. The background is relatively f simple, so shouldn't spend too much time on that. And we should be wrapping up in about four hours, hopefully at the very, the end of things. So, um, also just before I, I move on, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. About 70% of the people who watch this channel are not subscribers. You know, there's two and a half million views on this channel and 33,000 subscribers. So you can do the math and figure out how many people watch versus how many people subscribe. And then you can, you'll know why YouTubers are always asking people to hit the subscribe button, right? Because the vast majority of people don't. But anyway, uh, if you want to support the channel just by subscribing, that is hugely helpful. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation to help keep the lights on here, to help me buy new cables and things as they uh, go through their wear over the past 300 and almost 50 episodes we've done here. So um, that would be great. And so you can use PayPal, the YouTube Super Chat while we're live or send an email uh, to contact me to send an e-transfer or a check in the mail, those kinds of things, or a good old fashioned letter package, new car, whatever you might think is necessary. All those links are down below. My email's on my website and the Facebook group. And just a quick little shout out to the Facebook group. Um, there, it's a really wonderful place for people, probably like yourself, if you're watching right now, to gather and to talk about art, to look at um, work by other people in the group, to get inspired and to offer each other assistance. And once a month, I go through the group and find, um, uh, I take everything off here 
and I offer people free feedback on their artwork. So if you want to, to get my opinion on how you might be able to improve your work, often I'm just congratulating people because people are doing a great job. So um, I encourage you to do that. Uh, the question, uh, Jean says, where can I find the drawing? The, the drawing, there's a, a link to the Dropbox folder in the video description below, but I will just copy and paste if I can do this. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, so there's a Dropbox link. I think is the very first thing in the video description below. You can find that, and that will take you to uh, the folder, and it's folder 00Z32, <laughs> because obviously that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, <laughs> so let's get started. Let's get an image on the canvas. And again, you could do the free drawing course, learn how to draw, and then sketch this out by eye, or you could down the free you could download the free downloadable template that I made for this image. So there's the original, and then here's the outline that I did on the Procreate app using my iPad Pro, and then we're gonna transfer it onto this canvas. So once you download that, print it out on your inkjet printer at home, or laser jet printer, the local photocopy place down the street, or at work, or whatever, then you know you print it out on, on on regular paper and we're going to transfer it onto this um, 9 by 12 sized canvas panel or canvas board same thing um, and so these I order from Amazon they come wrapped in plastic you pay roughly two dollars a piece they come in a pack of 12 for 24 bucks Canadian which is what like $18 American and I like these better than the ones you can get stuff like this at the dollar store for a buck um, I think these ones are, you know, they're twice as much, but they're they're ten times better than the one you get at the dollar store. They're certainly going to last longer. They're intended to be archival, which may or may not be the case, but probably by the time we find out whether they're archival or not, you and I are going to be long gone, right? That's for uh, conservator, conservators a couple generations down the line to worry about we got to keep them employed so make sure sometimes you use maybe lesser materials so that they have something to do right okay uh anyway they come wrapped in plastic i take it out of the plastic i give it a gentle sanding with some 220 grit sandpaper and then i apply some white acrylic gesso onto the surface let it dry overnight and then sand it down with some 100 grit sandpaper and then I get a, a relatively smooth surface. Some artists will do another coat of gesso, sand that and do another coat so that they get a super smooth surface. I think, you know, one is enough. Some people don't do any sanding at all. Some people want a highly textured surface and all the power to them. Um, that's not something I'm interested in. I find that um, it a little bit, it's kind of hard to paint on a really textured surface but to each her own, right? So with this image here, obviously you could see that there's a little bit of space in the top and bottom. It just depends on how comfortable you feel imagining what those fingers are gonna look like. So maybe I'm just gonna put it a little bit, I'll put it basically in the middle. And then as I paint this, I'm gonna sketch in that third finger down there in the bottom, or I guess fourth finger if you can, if you count the thumb, which is a finger, but you know what I mean, right? Okay, so I've taped it down here, and now I'm going to use some graphite transfer paper. You can see one side's kind of darker and one side's gray. The darker side is the side that has graphite on it. You can buy carbon paper. There are different things that do exactly the same thing. I'm going to slide the dark side facing down because that's I want that carbon to get rubbed off onto the canvas. And then I'm just going to trace over these lines. And we don't have to do a perfect job of it. Um, I'll just draw this right over top right now, just so you can see. 
Maybe that finger needs to be a little bit thicker. That's okay. We'll we'll come back to it later on and quote unquote fix it. So this is her uh, self-portrait she made of herself while she was pregnant. And this is one of the, the last few paintings that she made during her short life. And a uh, very tragic, sad end. She uh, so... You know, it's one of those situations where you just wonder what on earth would she have done had she lived another five years, ten years, fifty years? And how would art history be different as a result? She was already, the day she died, a, a fairly celebrated artist within the art community. She, uh, she wasn't wealthy by any means, um... But she was starting to achieve some renown and respect throughout the the Parisian art world in, in Germany. So yeah, it's one of those eternal um, what ifs. Okay. That's good. Here we go. So I like to keep those outlines nearby so that I can refer to them if necessary. Okay. Let's just move all that out of the way oh wow look at all the people in the chat all of a sudden I look away and there's genie lolly jean uh, pascal awesome Pascal says, uh, maybe you'll paint the Van Gogh sunflowers. It fits with spring. I'm not sure if you were talking to me or to Lolly. Um, I did do a, many years ago, probably like 10 years ago, I did an episode dedicated, before I started doing all of these live streams during the pandemic, I did an episode on painting Van Gogh sunflowers, a very simplified version, but it does exist there. I think probably eventually I'll, I'll redo it. Um, oh, um, Pascal went to the uh, George O'Keefe exhibition that just recently opened. Awesome. Okay, let's uh, let's move forward here. I'd love to hear that, but all about that show, Pascal. <laughs> Now that we've got our image on the canvas, let's stain it with some color. Now you don't have to do this, and more now than ever, artists do not do this step. I think that's a bit of a mistake or a missed opportunity at the very least, uh, considering many of the greatest artists of all time uh, used this method to get their paintings started. And for me, it's just a great way of of just starting the painting. I don't really have to think about things because I've got a bit of a routine, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Uh, just quickly before I do that, I uh, just want to mention, you know, the kinds of paint that we're going to be using, or at least that I'm going to be using, and if you want to get the same results as I am, you may want to consider uh, getting something similar. So the method that I like to use is what's called the split primary palette. 
And so essentially what we're doing is we're taking the so-called three primary colors and splitting them in half. So that's why we've got two yellows, two reds, and two blues, because every color's got a temperature. And once you understand color temperature, you're able to really create paintings with a lot of depth, the illusion of space. Even if you're creating a abstract painting or non-representational painting, being aware of how color works is really going to allow you to get certain effects that um, you might find so exciting about abstract paintings you might see in a museum somewhere. Like, how come theirs look so good and mine just look like something my kid could do kind of thing, right? So anyway, you use these six tubes plus white. You can mix about 95% of the colors that the human eye can see. Now, we don't even need to buy a black tube of paint, <clears throat> even though I do own some, because we can mix all of, we can mix black with just the colors that we're about to use. So I like this particular brand of paint here, uh, Amsterdam. Now I'm not sponsored or paid by them in any way. Um, I bought them just like uh, anybody else has, and uh, I'm not wasn't given any free trips to the George O'Keefe exhibition, for instance. Um, I paid for them just like everybody else. And I think they're the best bang for the buck, the, the highest quality paint for the cheapest price that you can buy. I've used them for my in-person classes all the time, and I'm using them to illustrate a graphic novel that I've been working on for years. And yes, trust me, I'll let you all know when that one is anywhere near completion and ready to, uh, to purchase. Uh, so the colors that I'm putting on my palette right now correspond to what you see there on the screen. And I'll show you here in a moment. If you say like, oh, well, I don't have that brand, um, you can order them online. I'm sure you can find a company that will mail them to you. Just do double check. Uh, Amazon, I don't think is the best place to buy paint, acrylic paint, sometimes for other things, but do your, your uh, research before you spend your hard earned money. Other brands that you could use are Golden, Lascaux, uh, Liquitex, Windsor & Newton, and I'm going to keep on going through this list. If you see any, you can pause, take a screenshot, or you could, in the description where you saw the Dropbox folder, the very top there, there's a uh, handout that has a list of all the different paints, just like this, which you can print out and then take to your local art supply store and see if they have any of these colors there. I don't guarantee that they're all going to work, but they should get you pretty close. Um, I haven't used all of these different brands personally, so I, again, I'm not sure if they're going to work, but they should be pretty close. Um, the main thing is, is just trying to get colors like your reds that are as distinct as possible so that they're not right next to one another on the color wheel. Um, now there's two brands I do not recommend, uh, Peebo and Museum Color. Uh, Museum Color is a very small Canadian brand based out of Toronto. Peebo is a major global brand found in art supply stores around the world. Both of these paints, however, I add a lot of titanium white to the mixture, which makes it impossible to mix a black, a true black. You get a very light gray because there's so much white in the paint. Now, every paint company tends to add white anyway to increase the opacity. It's a bit of a filler but these guys just add way too much. <laughs> I love the little emojis there, Lolly. that's great. Okay, so once we've got some paint, some of our, and I, again, I like to use this warm yellow. In fact, maybe let's just do a little double check and see what Paula herself did for this painting and see if we can uh, deduce what, if, if any, imprimatur she used here. So what we're looking for is trying to see a background color underneath the paint. And so you could see this kind of orangey red up here underneath the paint there. Sometimes you see it on the edges between colors. It's hard to say. She might have used a bit more of a traditional brown. Um, but I think this yellow that I'm about to use is going to work just fine. So. Let's, um, so I've got my warm yellow here on the palette. 
And now I'm going to take a little bit of water, just like lukewarm water. And this is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic paint. Um, because this helps the, the paint here soak into the surface of the canvas. Because essentially the imprimatur means the priming layer, or the first layer of paint. And we want to think of it as a stain, right? We're staining this surface and water is going to help it really soak into the plaster, right? So this gesso, gesso is basically acrylic paint with uh, plaster powder mixed into it. And so what it does is it fills in all the little gaps in the weave of the canvas, or not the gaps, but just that it helps fill in the textured surface of the canvas, which is a fabric, right? And um, it, uh, if you're painting on a canvas that's stretched over a frame, it'll tighten the canvas up to create like a drum-like surface. Uh, in this case, I'm, I gessoed over top of an already gessoed surface so that I could get a, a smooth a surface as possible. We'll take a look at her work here in a few minutes and you'll notice that she has a, a very wide range of um, styles and subject matter and so it's likely that she also experimented with lots of different techniques and so probably at some point maybe tried painting without an imprimatur just like this um, because a lot of artists around that time were starting to experiment with skipping this step. And then a lot of artists skipped it and then came back to it and tried using different colors as opposed to just um, the brick red color, brownish color that had been popular for 500 plus years, which was probably um, the reason why artists used a brown like that was to replicate the look of, of uh, wooden panels which artists had used for many years, beginning mostly during the Renaissance period. Okay, I like this warm yellow because it's nice and vibrant. It makes paintings kind of glow. It's got that um, golden hour kind of quality right before sunset. Speaking of spring, like Pascal said, like to clean my brushes as I go here so if I want to use it in 20-30 minutes I've got one nice and ready to go and it has some time to dry rather than getting all crusty and ruined before I've even got it anything done here okay Pascal's got some good advice about uh, when you visit a museum, how you don't have to look at everything. That's a great point. Some museums, like the Metropolitan in New York or the Louvre in Paris, are huge. I mean, literally, you could run through the entire museum and still not see every room in those museums in an eight-hour day. I'm, and I'm not kidding. There are huge spaces. So... Sometimes it's a good idea to kind of have a plan, like an objective. Okay, okay here's the 10 things that I really want to see while I'm here. And even then, that might mean you're having to go all the way from one end to another. So sometimes just saying, okay, today I'm just going to look at this wing of this museum. And it really sucks to, I might not be in New York or Paris for another decade, but it's better to kind of really absorb a few artworks that you really like rather than feel really rushed and you're spending, you know, one or two seconds with, with uh, some really great paintings, right? Just imagine listening to songs and just skipping after two or three seconds, like, 
after you fully experience what those songs really are. So great advice, Pasco. Um, Deborah says, I like doing the input amateur layer because it gets rid of the white and I can blend easier. That's totally true. Yeah, that smoother surface makes it easier to blend for sure. Um, also, again, just like you said, Deborah, if once you get rid of that white surface, it's not so scary anymore, right? Now, of course, you have another whole challenge with this yellow here, but if you, but I always feel it's like okay, the painting's started. You know, it's it's sort of like, you know, you're at your the Olympics and people are going to 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 get in their racing blocks and like oh count down for the race to begin and you just put some yellow on it. it's like boom we're already going and people are like what you started yep yeah, i'm started i'm already going i'm not even you know <laughs> so i i just feel it's like great it's just uh, like, it's something i can do almost instinctively by this point okay so let's So now I want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about today's artist. I want to talk um, a little bit about where she came from, the kinds of work that she's known for, and why she uh, is such a celebrated artist, you know, uh, over a hundred years after she passed away at the unfortunate young age of 31 years old. So, Paula Modersen Becker is born in 1876 and passes away in 1907, just under three weeks after giving birth to her daughter, her, her first and only daughter, Mathilde. Um, so, she is born in kind of the, the near this uh, Frederickstadt in uh, Dresden, which... Um, uh, was a beautiful old um, kind of medieval a city with lots of great be beautiful medieval architecture but during World War II was almost obliterated by allied bombing because there was a lot of um, uh, munitions factories airplane factories etc located in this town so a lot of the original buildings and things that would have been there when when Paula was growing up, uh, have have long since disappeared. But just sort of to give you an idea of where her birthplace was, is right here in uh, the eastern part of Germany, south of Berlin, close to the Czechia uh, border here. You know, probably closer to Prague than you know. I guess sort of halfway between Prague and Leipzig. So. Um, she she was born um her father was in the the railway business he was an engineer and um i thought although i think he had kind of more of a desk job not actually you know the guy on the train pulling the whoo -hoo. <laughs> uh, and her mother came from a, a kind of aristocratic family so when she was growing up the family you know, was probably upper middle class, I would say. Uh, and she came from a, a fairly large family. I think she had, uh, I can't remember if it says in here or one of the other. She, she had, I think, like six or seven brothers and sisters, you know, it's, or there, she, the third of seven children, right? Uh, so a, a relatively large family. But, you know, about a decade before she was born, um, the family was engulfed in a major scandal because her father's brother, Oscar Becker, uh, was involved in an unsuccessful assassination or an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate the King Willem of Prussia. Shot him in the neck, but the king survived. And obviously, uh, Becker was um, uh, captured, imprisoned, tortured. And it really cast a dark shadow over the family. Um, just as, you know, we think about, you know, criminals today, you know, even if it's someone who had nothing to do with, you know, a, a famous murder, everyone in that family is feels sort of 
uh, under the shadow of of that um, the, the that family member. So that was something that you know I'm sure probably caused some stress and anxiety. You know when you know little kids on the playground being taunted, like your your family is the are a bunch of traitors and tried to kill the king. You know, so that probably, you know, in the back of her mind, made her f- kind of put her on a little bit of a of a uh, uh, a course of feeling. Uh, g- gave her, I think, a bit of an independent streak. I think she also felt um, she she at different times talked about being feeling kind of ostracized from various different communities, and I, I know. Sometimes when I talk about this stuff relating to kind of the youth of artists, it sounds like I'm kind of making a little bit out of nothing. And, I, and I'm just totally speaking out of thin air. I don't know how or what impact that might have had on our life at all. But I just think about, you know, all of us, you know, we're all impacted by things that we saw and did when we were kids. And um, often it sometimes comes out in weird ways as we grow older. Uh, so I, I can't help but think that that would have obviously been um, a bit of uh, played into perhaps you know her more feminist tendencies towards the end of her life. So anyway, uh, she is has a, a, a growing interest in art. The fact that her mother comes from a more aristocratic uh, 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 background meant that there were opportunities available to her growing up that might not have been available to other children, especially other girls. Uh, She was given an opportunity to study drawing. She had some private tutors come and teach her. And she um, uh, became, you know, uh, well, 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 let's just say, so while she, when she's kind of in, in her early teens, um, she travels to uh, London, England to study English for a short period of time. And while she's there, she goes and sees many of the museums in London and sees a lot of great art. Remember, she's, she's coming from Dresden, which, you know, is not, it's not a small, insignificant town, but it's not one of the, the great capitals of, of culture uh, that she she ends up going to a little bit later on in her life. So when she travels to London, it's definitely kind of an eye-opening experience. So that really cements in her the, um, the, the, uh, the idea of making art. And, you know, while she's away, she takes art classes at the St. John's Woods Art School. Uh, she, when she returns, um, uh, the family moves to Bremen. And let me just show you where... So they moved from Dresden, I think she actually moved from Dresden to Bremen before she went to England, uh, but uh, this really becomes the Bremen the and the area around where she um, really be, settles and where most of her kind of most well-known artworks um are made besides that in Paris which we'll get to in a moment so Bremen is kind of in the northern part of western Germany here kind of not too far away from uh, the Netherlands and if we go a little bit further up here into Denmark right near Hamburg where the Beatles did many of their residencies before they stormed America right Um, let's bring that back up here for a moment Um, So, while she's in Bremen, she takes some art classes there. She also uh, officially enrolls in, I think it was called the uh, Women's Women's Academy, uh, which was, you know, there was a lot of those sort of schools around the time. There were sort of preparatory schools for young women to turn them into good wives and and mothers, etc. And often, many of those schools had programs that uh, really focused on Things like painting and and you know sewing and cooking, etc. Uh, but I think she was really you know really showed quite a lot of promise 
for making for for making art to the point where when she was 16 years old her parents allowed her to set up an, an art studio in the house they dedicated a room to her i'm sure there was you know some of the younger kids and you know were playing with their toys in there but as a 16 year old young woman she's making art and she's even displaying it and selling those pieces to some of the like the neighbors in the in her community so the family is supportive of her interest in art which as we we know is not always the case in fact is maybe a little bit more uh, unusual especially at this time again consider you know make being an artist most parents are usually not very supportive of their children going into the arts whether they're, they're male or female or otherwise uh, i'm i'm very fortunate my parents were very supportive of me when i was um, growing up and interested in art uh, but most of my friends growing up their parents certainly were not supportive of the, that decision uh, so i you know i consider myself very lucky so if you go back a hundred years before that before me um you see the the vast like it's very unusual to find a family that is uh supportive of uh their children's interest in making art and especially if you're a young woman because back in the day if you're a young woman who is showing a great deal of interest in art um as opposed to finding a good you know job until you were able to get married off to some uh, lucky guy who was going to uh, you're going to have his children right um uh basically the main fear would be like well you're you're just gonna die lonely and you'll never find a, a man to take care of you and you'll be you'll be you'll go crazy and you'll be starving so it is to their credit that they they were supportive of her interest in art uh, she took some classes in berlin so she travels there in 1896 so that's what when she is um 20 years old she travels there and you know so she's getting a lot of exposure to art and and being encouraged to pursue her interest in art at a time where that is very unusual for a young woman yeah and, and as i said even for a young man right and um so i think uh you know i should also say at this time where she's taking some classes you know in her early you know late teens she was also studying to become a teacher but it was very clear both to herself obviously but to her family that she had zero interest in pursuing a career as a teacher that she was determined to make art um, so uh, one of the things that she um, did uh, you know while she was away in Berlin is she met a number of um, of really interesting artists and also activists kind of figures uh, one of the figures that she meets in Berlin is a woman who becomes known as a, a fairly important uh, uh, feminist activist Natalie von Mild um, who you know puts into her into her mind you know some of these ideas that you know uh, women can do anything that women are equal to men I mean crazy stuff obviously <laughs> right uh, and you know I think obviously again that really you know you know that makes a huge impression on uh, Paula because she's she you know she sees like oh you know some of the the the, the dreams and desires I have for myself you know I can see that you know I'm surrounded by a culture or society that does not is not particularly supportive of what I do I'm grateful for my family but the wider culture is not particularly supportive of it and yet I meet this young woman who is like yeah you can do anything just forget what all these old bearded guys tell you go for it follow your dreams however when her family hears that she's sort of finding her way into some of those circles they become very upset they're like you know what we're supportive of your artistic ambitions but you know let's just pump the brakes on some of the more progressive activist kind of stuff um, because I could, you know, really get you in trouble back then in the day, right? Um, you know, there were some of those early feminist movements, 
um, were had were were uh, had you know some of them advocated for violence, not just you know uh, peaceful sit-ins and things, and so there was you know um, governments were very oppressive when it, you know they were oppressive anyway towards women, but when women started to kind of um, uh, uh, take action to try to to create a better situation for themselves, the governments did not like that. So there was, you know, you could understand why her family kind of were anxious about some of those interests that she had. Um, and, it, and it, uh, you know, those, those ideas didn't fully go away throughout the course of her young life, right? She only, at 10 years from now, she is dead, right? So um, there's not a lot of time for, for her, um, uh, and so, anyway, so one of the things that she, she hears artists talking in Berlin about this artist colony outside of Bremen, and let's, um, so, outside of Bremen, there is this artist colony, the Konstarztkolonin Vosved, Vops? Ved? I don't know how you would say all. I'm doing my best, uh, but it's but this means artist colony uh, in this little community outside of Bremen here, and in this artist colony there is a uh, a, a large number. Well, not a large. I think it was about like a hundred or so artists living there, and the main focus of their attention is landscape painting a kind of impressionist inspired landscape painting so maybe we can i don't know if okay i should also say just before i, I start looking at some of the works by paula uh, modersen becker is that she was very interested in the female nude in particular and so um we may see some nude drawings and paintings of women, including self-portraits by Paula Modersen Becker. So if that is something that might offend you, uh, then you may want to grab yourself a cup of tea and watch some cartoons for the next 10 minutes and come back. And uh, I don't know why you'd have tea and cartoons. That would be an odd thing to do, but... Um, if whatever you might want to do to preserve the purity of your eyes, um, there's, in fact, maybe. So, you know, here hmm, we we start. So this group, as I said, in um, how how, sh how, do, how how should we pronounce that? Vopsveda, Vopsveda, um. This this artist calling of Varfseta was was basically obsessed with the landscape, and and you can understand why because it was something that also was uh, an, a, a focus of the impressionist painters, and the, the height of impressionism is like 1875 to 1890 or so, and so here she you know this is you know just five or six years after kind of the tail end of Impressionism as the post-Impressionist painters are coming into focus. The post-Impressionist painters being most famous Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, his friend Paul Gauguin, and then another group of, of mostly Parisian artists called Les Nabis, um, uh, led by Pierre Bonnard, right? So that's the sort of group of artists that, that are making art in that period between the Impressionists, like Claude Monet and Camille Pissarro, Berta Morisot, Mary Cassatt, uh, then you have the Post-Impressionists and Les Nabis, and then you have all of the other avant-garde art movements, like Les Fauves, or Les Fauves, led by Matisse, and then soon Cubism, led by Braque and Picasso, etc. So anyway, um, but the Impressionist movement was in many ways a rebellion against the academic approach to painting 
which often happened entirely indoors, was inspired by like mostly a lot of like genre painting uh, portraits of rich kings and queens, landowners, etc. And so the impressionists, one of the things that they were they did was instead they would go outside and paint buildings and things that they saw in the landscape. They, because of innovations in technology, they could take paints that were pre-mixed and, and put into tubes and packaged into tubes, go for a walk and paint outside, something that had been impossible up until then throughout um, at least European art history. So we see like all, a lot of these, um, these early paintings and sketches, you know, they, they remind me a lot of the Impressionist painters and also a bit of Les Nabis as well. Although I, at this point, I'm not sure if she would have seen any Les Nabis paintings. Let's just, um, when did she first go to Paris? Okay, so in Paris, 1899. Uh, so it's in 1899 where she first sees many of the, the artworks by um, artists like uh, Pierre Bonnard and, and Gauguin, Maurice Denis, etc. And so you see kind of the, uh, some colors of the Impressionists and then more of a kind of abstract representation of the landscape that is becoming more and more imaginative, more and more subjective interpretation of the landscape. So here's some of the artworks that she did when she was in school before she goes to Paris. Although actually some of these could have been done when she was in Paris. Because what she did when she goes to Paris in December 1899 is she stays in Montmartre where, you know, all of the that was like the main art place at the time. It was you know, kind of the, the red light district of Paris. It's on the outskirts of the city. There's also farms around there. It's a very, where a lot of itinerant workers who are traveling come and stay and work in that area, work in the nightclubs, um, women working in the red light district. And uh, so a lot of artists lived in Mont, uh, uh, Montmartre because it was very cheap rent. It was a it was a pretty crummy area of town. Now it's beautiful. Lots of great coffee shops. I love walking around there. There's kind of little hills. It's beautiful. But it was, you know, a lot of crime and stuff in that area at the time. Um, oh, I should also mention too, just really quickly, just kind of, um, I thought it was kind of interesting is that uh, when, while she was in uh, Vorpsvede, uh, that artist colony. She also ran into a few interesting artists, and particularly the poet uh, Rainer Maria Rilke. How do you say? I've tried. I'm, maybe I've never said Rilke's last name. Rainer Rainer Maria Rilke. Hmm, Rilke. I have read many. Of, I've read a few of his books, but I just realized I don't think I've ever pronounced his name. Um, uh, great poet. And um, this is this book here, kind of essential letters to a young poet, is is a great short book, um, often given to artists when they're young. You know, I might have even been my parents might have given me that book when I started art school. Anyway, I just think it's kind of cool sometimes those interactions when artists and and poets and writers interact and and intersect. Uh, anyway, so she goes to Paris. While she's in Paris, uh, she meets all sorts of artists. Uh, she ends up, she meets, you know, Auguste Rodin, the great uh, figurative sculptor. Uh, she sees a lot of art by uh, Les Nabis. Um, she probably didn't meet Paul Gauguin, uh, but she certainly would have seen his work, because I think Gauguin dies fairly soon after this, in the early... 1902 or something um, but he is definitely probably the most celebrated artist of the time in Paris so you know it's it's um, it, you know going to Paris at the turn of the last century 
would have been one of the most exciting places on Earth to be. And it was very... It was very cosmopolitan, but also one of the few places where women could be, you know, as free as they could probably be anywhere on Earth. There, there was a, you know, the, the art community, like, it was a little bit of, there was a lot of, like, let's say free love happening in, in Paris around that time. Very open-minded um, uh, people, okay? Let's just put it that way. And so, um, would have been been pretty wild for for her to have experienced that uh, during the in, uh, and so she starts kind of doing these trips back and forth between uh, Bremen, Vorpsvede, and Paris, and so this sort of triangular movement back and forth every couple of years. And while she's in Paris, she meets another artist. Well, she had met him already in that artist colony, Vorpsvede, um, Otto Modersen, who later becomes her husband in May of 1901. And uh, um, he had been married previously to another woman, but while he was visiting Paris, his wife passed away. And so he had, I think, one, one or two children with um, his former wife, uh, yeah, or one child. Um, Elsbeth was her name. So, um, Paula, you know, I think she probably was, um, you know, I think she, there, the, there was, she, you know, if you read some of the things that she wrote or other people wrote about her, there was, there was a bit of a push pull in her life as to, you know, wanting to pursue her art but also wanting to have a relationship. She was a little bit ambivalent about ever having children, but, you know, I think, you know, at that time, just like society was like, was, you know, if, if you were going to be a single woman in your 20s and then in your 30s um, without being married, without, you know, pursuing children, you were a bit of like you were kind of an outcast. You were definitely not following the norm. And so as much as she probably wanted to pursue her own life and goals and stuff, there would have been a tremendous amount of pressure for her to conform to society's dictates. So I think her starting this relationship with this, with this artist, um, Otto Modersen, was sort of maybe, I think, probably as best as she could probably think imagine she could get is another artist who who could certainly identify with her ambitions and her desire to make and pursue her her art um, but also someone I think she could see herself having a family with having said that that relationship was kind of rocky and during the during the relationship there's, you know, some conflict and she leaves for periods of time, sometimes like upwards of a year, leaves um, him and his daughter, Elsbeth, in uh, Bremen and, and uh, Wurzbede, uh, leaves and goes back to Paris and spends a little while there and then kind of comes back and then tries it and then comes back to Paris. So, um, uh, you know, because I think she, again, feels like, oh, this is maybe just like any other relationship, you know, uh, maybe I'm with an artist, but it's, maybe it's not all that, you know, I it might, it might as, you know, so anyway, um, she does, she is super productive though, during the, the, you know, that time, um, especially when she's able to get away from her husband and her stepdaughter, uh, and those responsibilities, she's able to do a lot of work. However, in kind of 1906, 1907, she does, she feels like, you know, she is married to this guy and maybe she should give it one last shot at reconciling uh, that relationship. Um, and her, her husband wants another child. So she's like, well, if I'm going to do this, okay, let's do this now. Uh, and so... In 1906, she becomes pregnant, and one of the things that makes her 
a um, a trailblazer is that despite the fact that she's pregnant, she embarks on a whole series of self-portraits of painting herself while she's pregnant. She's considered to be the first artist in human history, as far as anybody knows, to make self-portraits of herself while she's pregnant. Um, and then not only that, she starts making self-portraits of herself while she's pregnant, while she's nude as well. Two things which were very taboo at the time. Um, even if you look through like art history, there's very few paintings by men of pregnant women. Uh, pff, obviously, let alone p paintings by women of pregnant women. And certainly not up until Paula Modersen Becker comes around are there any paintings, self-portraits of women while they're pregnant and certainly not while they're nude. Those things being incredibly taboo. I don't know what would necessarily be taboo about making a painting of a of a pregnant woman. I, I'm not sure what what that's about. Um, I I can I suppose I can kind of understand why it might be you know just any kind of nudity is is was at least back then very taboo. And the idea of a woman making a portrait of herself while she's nude was also quite taboo because it was. Um, essentially, you know, in art school, um, the painting the nude was reserved only for men. So there were art schools that, that had men and women in them at this time, a hundred years ago. But when it came to drawing the figure, women could, were only allowed to draw clothed men and women, whereas the men were allowed to draw nude men and nude women. Uh, it was just seen as women's women's eyes and sensibilities were too fragile to to lay um, to uh, sight of a, of a nude body. You know, like I mean, just it, it would just ruin them forever. Obviously, <laughs> those delicate flowers. So um, she uh, um, by painting herself nude. Uh, and while she's pregnant was was a was a huge taboo and it you know really wasn't fully recognized until after she passed away so during this last um, year of her life uh, she is super productive which again is is was a little bit unusual there was expectations that you know as soon as you get pregnant okay well let's put away all of your dreams and desires and, you know, maybe when your kids are all grown up and move out of the house, then you can start painting again. But for the next 20 years or so of your life, you're going to dedicate yourself purely to your children, right? And um, she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm pregnant. I'm going to be a mother. But no way in, on earth am I going to give up my goal of making, of being an artist, you know, as she says, to be somebody. And... I'm, I'm in fact I'm gonna make paintings of myself while I'm nude I'm gonna document my body as it changes while this this little person is growing inside of me so again I'm gonna look at some nude uh, images here if that offends you certainly feel free to turn away so these are works that she's making probably you know at, maybe when she first arrives in Paris and, and when she kind of returns back to um, Bremen uh, and Wurzbede. Um So you can see the palette in these paintings. Like in a lot of her work is a little bit darker. Um, that tends to be something that's, that, that we see a lot in, in German painting anyway. Um, even though the palettes of artists at this time are starting to get brighter and brighter. If we look at the work of some of the Les Nabib painters like Marie Denis, uh, Vlam or not Vlamanc, uh, but um, uh, Pierre Bonnard, um, Cerisier, um, and then the, the uh, post impressionist painters like Gauguin Van Gogh, very bright colors. So she's inspired, I think, obviously by the compositions of those of those works 
the, the, the how they become much more imaginative, uh, less rooted in direct observation. Or, I mean, they are direct observation, but the artist is allowing themselves to inject their own subjective vision of the world onto these artworks. Another thing that she's very well known for are painting images of other women uh, and also of children. Now, that's not unusual because that was one of the only things that women were allowed to paint for like 500 years um, is paintings of children and other women. But again, I think she really starts to kind of make this a, a focus of her work. You know, it's like not just something that the only thing she's allowed to do, but something that she finds actually quite fascinating because she, I think she's uh, having been exposed to some feminist activists and a little bit earlier in her career, I think she's becomes very interested in, in what is women's role in society and um, what does constitute women's work, etc. And especially when she sees, you know, many of her friends who have families um, and sees kind of their struggles to make something of themselves within the contemporary society, I think she becomes, um, um, she wants to make that a central theme in her work. So you're seeing all of the, like, you know, we can look, I mean, I'm sure we'll see more drawn, like, I guess what I want to show, show here is, like, look at some of these works, these paintings of, like, faces, for instance. We look at these, and they have, like, what we might call, like, a naive quality, right? They're very simplified. You know, they're, they're, they are the kind of things that people say, my kid could paint that. And yet she had... Um, extensive experience doing a figure drawing and being able to draw likenesses very well and yet she's choosing to make paintings and drawings like this which have a more I guess we might say today a cartoony quality and so you know um, it's it's just sort of worth asking well what would provoke someone to kind of turn away from this more realistic method of drawing and painting and incorporate um, more, um, how would you just, more simplified forms, um, more, um, almost more kind of like folk art approach to painting and I think that you know it goes to probably what a lot of artists in Paris at this time right this is 1903 this is right during the time Picasso's doing his I think this is his blue period at this time or maybe he's just moved into the rose period I can't remember but you look at those works very simplified um, this is shortly after 1900, April 1900, there's the, the famous Paris Exposition. And during that exposition, you have uh, a whole area dedicated to African art. And a lot of artists at that time, Picasso and Brock obviously being the, the, the most prominent, spent a lot of time in that exhibition looking at the African masks and seeing really for the first time that there's a whole different way of depicting the human face and the human body that they're looking at African art and it's just like whoa I've never never occurred to me that you could do that wow um maybe we should try to incorporate these different methods of working into our own artwork um, so while a lot of people look at you know um the that African art is just being cultural appropriation by people like Picasso and the modernist um, avant-garde painters. I think there was also a genuine fascination of a, a whole different way of making art that probably had just never occurred to them. Certainly would not have been taught to any of those artists in school because God forbid like you treat any African art as as equal to European academic paintings, um, uh, uh, let, you know, you wouldn't want to study them or teach them to anyone except to tell people what not to do, right? Uh, because of just the, the racist views at the time. But obviously artists being a little bit more open-minded, 
uh, saw this as, as, as quite interesting. Here, you know, you see some things almost seem inspired by Edvard Munch, right? These uh, kind of silhouetted, uh, faceless kind of forms. You could see, you know, this is something you could imagine uh, Matisse doing at that time, increasing simplification of form. Um... Okay, so it's you can see towards the very end of her life where the color really starts to, to come into play here. And this is also coincides with the, with the rise of Henri Matisse and the Fauvist painters at this exact time, right? So during this time, she's um, in Paris and she's just cranking out paintings. Um, and Matisse is now becoming the, the most famous artist in the world. And lo and behold, her own paintings become, it's almost like she's been given permission to use colors right out of the tubes. So here's the painting that we're gonna uh, attempt to recreate today. And then, you know, these last few are, you know, when she's moved back to Bremen and trying to make it a go with her husband of uh, six years. Um, and she's pregnant and probably also painting some of her her friends who are themselves pregnant as well, right? Because um, anyone who's had a child probably has gone to a few classes. I mean, I, I don't think they were they are like they are today, but you probably you start meeting other young families leading up to the birth of your child. So I'm sure she probably met a few of them who might have been also happy to have something to do. Um, and so if you ran into a woman who was like, you mind if I paint your portrait? They're like, sure, anything to get me off my feet for 20 minutes. Um, okay, so there's tons of resources here. I'll put all these links in the description below. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, she's definitely, you know, I, th I think it's we're in a really interesting time right now where um, a lot of women artists that have sort of been overlooked over the past 100 years are getting reappraised. And uh, Paula Modersen Becker is, is certainly one of those, you know, uh, like Hilma F. Klint. Um, and then I, well, I have many of the Canadian female artists we've been talking about over the last three years. And I think... You know, it. it um, I, I think it was it's certainly a a shrewd um, decision and and smart one at that for the Museum of Modern Art to buy this portrait um, for their collection. This they only acquired it just like a couple of years ago. I don't know if there's even does it mention so 2017 it was purchased um, to grow uh, this collection. Uh, let me just kind of let's go back here. So, uh, just kind of towards the very end of her life, you know, she gives birth to their daughter Matilde on November second, nineteen oh seven, and you know, at the time she gives birth to her child, it's a very very happy moment, right? As I'm sure it is for for most families, or if not all, I, hopefully, uh, but. Very soon afterwards, she starts to experience pain in her legs, and you know, and she eventually dies of deep venous thrombosis, uh, which is, I guess, apparently, um, you know, due to having her staying in bed for a long time after delivery, which I guess was the custom practice at the time. Uh, but essentially, she died very quickly, kind of suddenly, and. Um, it, it was kind of, it was definitely, a, I mean, a shock to her family, but also to her, her friends and the art community back in Paris, where she had be, was becoming a rising star. And, uh, you know, I think p many people saw her as, you know, an artist who was good enough to hang with the boys and who was going to be able to carve a, a, a real deep, solid path for many other female artists following in her wake. So much so that after she passed away, um, within just a few short years, 
a museum dedicated entirely to her work was opened in Bremen. And where is it? So the Paulerson Modersen, Paula Modersen Becker Museum in Bremen, uh, which still exists to this day, um, was the very first museum anywhere on earth that was uh, dedicated purely to a single artist, a single female artist. Obviously, there had been museums dedicated to men, uh, a single artists, single male solo artists in the past. But this is the first time where where an, a female artist is given their own museum, and, and so that is is also in and of itself um, says how deeply appreciated and missed she was after she passed away. That clearly large numbers of people in her kind of adopted hometown felt like there was a, a major um, hole missing after she died. And so that, you know, I, I think that's the thing that says everything you need to know about, about, about her work. Um, what else do I want? Oh, I think lastly, um, when the uh, when the Nazis took over uh, Bremen and well Germany in general, uh, they went around systematically confiscating works by artists um, around uh, around Germany and often destroying them, burning them, and uh, in some cases they would exhibit these artworks which they deemed to be g degenerate artworks. So the Nazis, what they would do is they would have these exhibitions of art that w was by Jewish artists, homosexuals, um, uh, Romani people, and, um, and then also a lot of avant-garde art, art by people like Picasso and Matisse and, and Giorgio O'Keeffe, etc. would be gathered into these exhibition halls so that German people and the, the, the people that the Nazis had uh, were the territories that they were occupying could come and see so-called degenerate art. Um, obviously, those exhibitions turned out to be very popular because people wanted to kind of... Some of them wanted to go and, and, and laugh at the art that was on display, but some of them were... This might be the first time they get to see some of these artworks by artists who were becoming relatively famous at the time. So... She, um, her work was exhibited in those Nazi exhibitions and uh, tragically about 70 per 70 of her paintings were destroyed or lost during that time. So, um, you know, so many of the works that we have of hers today, um, are, is what's left over, what was able to be rescued or what was on display in those degenerate exhibitions, but managed to by mir miraculous means somehow to survive the war. And so who knows what beautiful artworks she created that are lost to time. You know, and, you know, in, in likelihood, many of the artworks that would have been on display were, might have been some of her best ones, not the ones that the Nazis considered to be the best ones. Um, so, I, you know, it's... Uh, it's there's sort of that double tragedy in her life of dying far too young and then you know uh, about 30 years later many of you know she made about 400 paintings during her lifetime and for 70 of them to disappear is almost one quarter of her entire life's output was was is has been lost um, i'm sure a few might might turn up over the next you know few decades but uh, probably uh, what we have is might be all that that is uh, uh, has survived the war. So, is there anything else I want to mention while we're here? I think let's get right to it. <laughs> Pascal asked Lolly, "Are you taking notes?" <laughs> okay, so. What we want to do now is we want to start putting some uh, color on here and we can just sort of take a look at whether we want to, to add some uh, underpainting to maybe help us 
as the painting starts to fill up with color because it can get a little confusing when you've got color and stuff going all over the place so you know the way that she painted this painting let's just see if we can discern how it was created it does look like she painted well i don't know that's i was gonna say it looks like well yeah it does look like she painted some of these dark lines at an earlier stage of the process so i think we let's Although, <laughs> you know what? I think I'm going to skip this step, and then and then we'll. I have a different way. I think I want to go about this. So, I'm going to skip the underpainting step and start going right into the background here. Because I think that's what she did here. I think she might have sketched this out with pencil. Might have done a little bit with paint. But I'm going to... I want to paint over... Yeah. Okay. So, let's start here uh, by painting the background to today's painting. So, if we look at this artwork here, really what we're going to do is focus on this dark area in the background. And what color actually is that? I think there's gonna we're gonna end up doing a couple of layers of paint. We're gonna put make it basically I think a mix our own black, and then we're gonna add some cool blue to it to make this really dark, almost kind of um, it's a bit of like a, a slightly muddy Prussian bluish green here. So let's get out our paint brushes and start mixing some paint. So, to make our own black, what we want to do is take our cool blue, our cool yellow, and then our warm red. So that if we mix these colors together, they're going to cancel each other out. So, what we've done here is we took our cool blue and our cool yellow, and we mix them together, we get this bright, saturated green. The opposite of green on the color wheel is red, right? So, and especially if we mix a warm red in opposition to these two cool colors, it's going to cancel uh, those colors, the red and the green are gonna get canceled out in what we call the neutral core. So this is definitely a harder thing to do to get it exactly right. But as I always say, perfection is the enemy of art. Or as Ansel Adams said, perfection is the enemy of good. Um, but I think the more we're obsessed with perfection, um, the, more, the less we're going to accomplish and the more frustrated we're going to become. So don't be too hard on yourself. So that color right now looks a little bit brown. So let's just think for, for a moment. What, what, what have we done, quote-unquote, wrong here? Well, how do we make brown? We make brown by mixing an orange and then adding blue to it, right? So if the color is brown, that means it's sort of hanging around here. So we need to add more blue to that brown to pull it back in the middle. In the same way, if you mix this and you got like a purplish color, well, then you're kind of hanging out down here. So we need to add more of this yellow to pull that purple in and as we said if it was a little bit green we need to add a little more red to pull that green towards the center um, so i'll add more blue here and get pretty close now it's not going to be exactly um uh, a black and nor do I think I even really want that. It's going to be, it's basically a very, very dark gray. And that's because all of these colors have a small amount of titanium white mixed in there anyway. So, um, you know, we can always go to our black paint if we really want it. But especially for this stage, I want to be very careful about actually using pure black. Because black... You know, if you think of a painting like a window into another world, black is like a bug sitting on the window, right? It sits right up close. 
So in, unless we want the background of this image to appear to somehow be in front of her, then we wanted to kind of use a, a slightly lighter black, like a little bit of a gray even perhaps, right? As artists have been doing for centuries. Unless, of course, you're going for like a chiaroscuro effect, you know, that effect of um, very theatrical lighting that artists like Leonardo da Vinci really promoted and probably made most famous by a late Renaissance painter called Caravaggio. So... Uh, anyway, we've got this dark color. I like that a lot, but I th I do want to kind of get back to this dark bluish green there. So I'm going to take the color I just mixed. Oops, let's I'll put these side by side here. Probably going to need a little bit more cool blue. Take this cool blue, let's make a kind of a good sized mixture of it. And then I'm just gonna take some of my black, mix it in here. Now maybe I'll even take a little bit of my um, cool yellow just to kind of get a slightly greenish quality back. Um, now, I, sh I should say, oops. you know, a, a question might be, well, why didn't we just mix, like, the cool blue and cool yellow and just a small amount of red? And we could do that. I just find it easier to mix the black to start and then to take a little bit of that black and use it to make this dark kind of greenish blue. But... If that's not the way you want to work, then don't work that way. Lots of lots of different ways that we can make art. Uh, there is also this yellow that's on the on our from our Impone Mature that's going to mix optically with this color. So I don't think it's um, I think we're going to be more than fine with the amount of yellow we've got here. I think it's going to make this color appear a little bit more green than it does right there. Okay, so let's just start applying this paint onto the surface. Oh, if anything, I might have, this might be a little bit too dark, but we'll see. I like getting the edges of my painting in. Painted, so I'm just gonna go around. I'm also not too worried about getting like a super solid color created here. As I don't think she was all that interested in that herself. I mean, I, I, you know, I guess I totally forgot to talk about, you know, um, Paula Modersen Becker is, is seen as one of the, the uh, first uh, expressionist artists. And expressionism was an art movement which took place all over, but particularly um, had its kind of high point in Germany. Uh, during the uh, early 1900s. Probably most people today might be more familiar with German Expressionist filmmaking than maybe even painting. Um, films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari or 
uh, even Metropolis are considered kind of exp German Expressionist masterpieces uh, as evidenced by kind of the the set designs being having kind of odd dramatic angles and part of expressionism was all about ex trying to to express the inner life of an artist like the feelings that one possesses inside okay so now that I like that color. It does seem very vibrant, more vibrant than I expected it to be. I think probably I could have added a little bit of white into that color. Because it's a little bit... Hmm. Yeah, not exactly the color I was going for, but that's okay. So what I'm going to do, let's blow dry this. Okay, I could paint that same color there again. I think, though, take pulling the sleeves up and taking my watch off. We're going to get serious here, folks. Okay, uh, I'm going to take some white. I don't think I need a lot of it. what I'm gonna take a bit of my I was gonna take put some more cool yellow but I'm gonna take some of my warm yellow here actually there we go that's the color we've all been looking for I probably should have painted that first to go even darker. Okay, let's try that. Oh, it looks a little bit lighter than I expected. And that's really the reason why it looks so much lighter is both the warm yellow I put in there, but even just that little bit of white in there has really um, lightened this up and made it a bit more opaque. So you could see how, you know, um, how much white, you know, affects the colors around it or affects the colors, out modifies colors. Of course, we did a whole episode on value and how to modify paints by changing the value. Value is how we measure light and dark in an artwork.
Now, I kind of like that. That dark green like that is pretty cool. Uh, the question is, do I want to put a little bit of black over top that? I think I will, but I think that's pretty successful at the moment. So I'm just going to get the excess paint off. I'm also just going to take all of this paint. I'm going to scoop it and then make a little kind of pile of it. So if anything should happen and I need that color later on, this might survive all the way through till I'm done the painting a few hours from now. Because sometimes things happen, you know, you're just about done and you drop your paintbrush in the middle of your painting and it screws up your background. It's nice to have just a little bit of extra paint left over as a backup. Thoroughly clean this brush. Okay, I'm going to blow dry this and then I'm going to do a little bit of glazing with some black to replicate the look of her painting. Obviously she painted in acrylic or in oil paint, so it's going to look, she wouldn't have done this exact same method. She probably would just have painted black directly into here, but and mixed it with the this kind of greenish blue that was existing, but anyway. Okay, so now let's take, I was going to paint just black, but I think I, when I look at what she's done here, I see these kinds of brownish qualities there. So I think what I'm, and that looks to me like a kind of a bit of a warmish orangey brown. So even though technically we want to keep all, all our warm colors in the foreground, if we really want to replicate the colors as she was using them, and I think we want to use a bit of some warmer colors. So I'm going to take my, uh, and we're going to be using this shortly anyway to mix our skin tones. So let's start out with our cool, or sorry, warm yellow, and then warm red. Mix that together, maybe a bit more yellow. And then take our warm blue. So to mix a brown, we take basically make an orange and add blue. The more blue you put in there, the darker it's going to get. Okay. I like that. You know, but if I paint that right on there, like that's going to be so strong, right? It's really going to stick out. So instead, what I'm going to do is use some satin glazing liquid, right? It's it's um, clear acrylic paint, and it's got a, a chemical in there that slows the drying time down. 
So let's just get rid of a bunch of that paint. In fact, I'm even just going to um, wipe off the excess paint here. Or, you know, so there's still some on here. I'm going to dip my paintbrush into my glazing fluid and get a little bit of paint. So right now, my brush is probably like 90% glazing fluid, just a little bit of this brown that I just mixed. So that I can do little changes to the painting without modifying it completely. So let's start with... And you might say, well, that's almost invisible. I can't really even see anything. Well, that's exactly the plan. <laughs> All right, I want to keep this subtle. If we're not, if we feel it's still too subtle, then we could just let it dry and add a second coat of something a little bit darker, or a, sec a second coat of this paint, and allow it to get a little bit dark. Kind of went over overboard there. So that looks quite bright at the moment, but I'm going to blow dry that and I expect it to kind of become a little more subtle here. So let's just give it some heat. Okay, so we see that it's, it, I, mean, I think in person actually it looks pretty good. It's super subtle, but I want to kind of get a little closer to the original. So I'm going to take a bit more, put some red in here. And even a little bit of blue and turn this into a darker brown. Let's see this again. There we go. I should also say, I was just using a, another brush. This is actually the same brush I, I used to do the Empire Matura. I was just using it to blend out and soften those edges of the paint there, just to make it a little bit less um, intense, less saturated. I do think, though, that while I've got this color mixed, I'm going to apply it onto her body here. So let's just... Just so we can see, I think underneath this, we've got a very orangey,
kind of like skin tone underneath here. So I'm going to take this color. This is kind of like what the Imprimatura is. I'm going to take this color. And I'm going to paint it. Oops. Now I could have just started the entire painting off this way with a kind of a light brown imprimatura. But had it occurred to me to do this earlier, I might have done it earlier. But um, clearly it didn't, right? And I think that sometimes it's like once the I start the painting, I realize things that maybe I could have done earlier that just weren't so obvious earlier, right? It's like, you know, you can you can tell yourself that you're going to think 30 steps ahead before you start a painting and just plan it to death, or you can just start it and then deal with whatever issues come up as they arise. And I just know from my own experience that if I just sit around trying to kind of outsmart the painting before I even begin, I'll never begin. Because I'm just not that smart. Right? So here, now I've got that started, the figure portion of the painting. Okay, now I just I think I might just do a little bit more in the background before I move on. So I'm going to blow dry that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think on camera, that that's very visible, that area up there. That might just be because of the way the light is hitting it from the side. Um, but in person, it is barely discernible. Like, it looks... Th these colors look very similar. So, and that, that could be a few things. I mean, again, it's the, the light shining on here. It's probably... It's not fully cured. It's still a little bit wet. And generally, I find when paintings are wet they they appear uh, or they, they tend to darken a little bit as they dry even acrylic paints despite the fact that you know it's dry right now to the touch I still find that there's always a little bit of change that's still to happen here so I'm not gonna do a little bit of glazing now with the black in fact since I've got all this glazing fluid here, I'm just going to take my black and mix it right into this brown.
Okay, that's pretty good. I think I want to come back and just darken a few more places, and then I'll be ready to move on from the background. But again, every time after I do a little bit of glazing, I want to use the blow dryer or go have dinner and come back so that the glazing fluid dries. Because if I start trying to apply more paint on top of this, what ends up happening is the paint is almost dry and then I paint into it and I end up kind of wiping it away and it'll peel off like, you know, the skin on the top of a milk that's been left on the counter for 24, 36 hours or something. It turns into this, it just peels right off and leaves kind of like a scab, you know, like if you're, you're like a kid playing on the, out on the street and then you, 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 know, you scratch your knee and the skin kind of pulls away. That's what it reminds me of. So I'm going to blow dry this before I apply another layer. I think that's good. That's cool. Okay. That allows us to move on from the background. Never to return again. Knock on wood. <laughs> ah, there's Ma and Kent in the chat there. Hello, Ma and Kent. See if we have any of the the Russian trolls in today's chat. Yesterday we had a a few <laughs> pay us a visit, which is always entertaining. Oh, I guess Kent was has been there for a while. I'm, I didn't realize how many. Uh, oh, there's a lot of big chat going on here. Okay. Wow. Oh, there's so many comments. If there's a if someone has a question for me and I missed it here because I want to continue painting, please just retype it in, copy and paste it again. Um, maybe with a little highlight at the beginning that says "question" in capitals, so that when I scan through here, I can um, more easily find uh, be able to answer the questions that you might have. Okay, now before I do move on, I'm just gonna last uh, just dry that background in a little bit more.
Okay. Now, I think I'm going to do my underpainting. So, which is a little bit kind of backwards, but I think this make will make sense as we, we go forward. Okay, now I know we've just spent time doing our background, but I think now I want to do my underpainting. And it's probably a little bit different than the way that she went about this painting. Um, but what I've done here is I've got my background in place, and then I also applied a uh, kind of like an imprimatur wash, this brown over top of my uh, previous imprimatur, that warm yellow just to give it a little bit closer to the way that her painting looked. And then now I'm going to go in and paint in a lot of the lines here with a black. Or, well, let's even actually just check it what color we should use here. I mean, that looks like there's a red in there. Oh, sorry. Um, I was looking at her chin. There's looks like some red in the black there. There's some grays. It looks mostly like a black, although a little bit kind of slightly grayish. Hmm, I think... I might use a bit of a slightly grayish black. We could it, we could do a, a... So there's two ways we could go about this. We could use black. We could use gray, which is black and white. Or we could do black, but dilute it with a little bit of like glazing fluid or matte medium. Um, and that's not the same thing. A black that is transparent is not the same thing as gray. Because um, gray, when we add white to black, it lightens it up, right? It's, um, uh, and it, it also has an increased opacity, whereas black with in fact, let's just do a little, let's do a little bit of both. Instead of me just trying to explain the difference between these things, let's do a little bit of both. So maybe, um, let me see. Where where do we have some areas that appear to be black? I think we see some black around like eyes. I don't know if it's worth just. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do all three, but I'm yeah, so let's just so we can see the differences here. So let's take some black. Uh, let's take we'll just start with black, just plain old black. Plain old black. So, for instance, on her nose here,
So first of all, this is just black that I've mixed. And it's pretty kind of thick and a little bit chunky, right? It doesn't want to apply very smoothly to this surface. All right. Okay, so there, that's just black all by itself. So now let's take some glazing fluid. We could do this with matte medium, although I prefer glazing fluid, because one of the nice things with glazing fluid is it's got a chemical that slows the drying time down, and what that means is if I make a mistake, I can just use, assuming everything is dry underneath that paint, I get a cloth, a little bit of water on it, and just wipe it right away like it never existed. It gives me that a little bit of opportunity to... This, this brush is towards the end of its life here. It's kind of... Let's see, if you, see how it's adopting this little bit of a curve? There you go. It's like a beak or a talon. Got that little crooked finger thing going on here. Anyway, I can mix a little bit of this paint in here. And now I've got a little bit of a semi-transparent paint. So it looks a little bit lighter. And you know, I mean, I've got a newer brush just like this right here, which I could use, but sometimes I, I kind of like using some of my um, brushes that have that are kind of on the last legs of their life for doing just stuff like this because they're first of all like I, I, I don't have to worry about treating this brush poorly or not I can kind of scrub in if I want because it's Kind of on its last legs anyway. And also it just sort of, I feel like, kind of just frees me up from uh, obsessing about perfection because it's... Uh, it's pretty hard to do anything perfect with a brush in this state. So I just think more about just getting things done rather than making things perfect. Okay, so there's, so I, I had a few lines that were just black. Here's some black with some transparency, the, the glazing fluid. And now let's take some white. Let's do white and black just together for a moment. So again, it's gonna be a little bit on the chunkier side of things. It's a little bit too dark. Let's just add a bit more black.
So, you know, what this is doing, using this kind of almost dead brush. Come on. As I just sort of get this kind of slightly broken kind of line, just, you know, gives it that rough quality. I personally like it, but... Now I'm just going to do the same sort of thing. I'm just going to now take this gray and add glazing fluid to this gray, which should make it a little bit easier to paint with being slightly more um, fluid-like. So even this little paintbrush that's all beaten up likes it. <clears throat> Maybe let's just take a little bit of the black, mix it in here. Now really, you could see there on the left where I've uh, used Photoshop to try to imagine what her arm or hand should look like. So that's the only part of this painting where I feel kind of like uh, we're going to be diverging from oops, the original. I mean, we are elsewhere, but you're really going to feel it there. Remember I kind of said that I didn't like how thin that finger was that I drew there, so I'm just going to widen it. Okay, so let's zoom out here. Maybe let's just quickly do her eyes. So another thing too is, you know, maybe her no nose is not quite as on mine's a little more pointed than the original, but I'm not too worried about any of that stuff right now. I just wanted to kind of get those lines on here, and then I'm gonna start blocking in the colors here in a moment. So let's just blow dry this real quick.
So great question. Kent says, so I know the quality of my paint may be the issue. It's from Dollarama, but how do I get some texture in my paintings? They seem very flat. Great question. So yes, it's true. The, I mean, the paint that you get from the dollar store is going to literally be the lowest quality paint possible. And they're also usually often in very small quantities. A few things that are going to result from that is there's going to be a lot of white mixed into those colors as a filler, as we've seen in many of the other, even some more expensive brands. Like, as I said, Peebo has a lot of white mixed in. And even though you can buy it at most art supply stores, I, I strongly discourage you from buying it because you certainly can't do what we're doing here today with even Peebo paint. It's going to drive you absolutely bonkers because you'll never be able to mix a black. Um, in terms of like texture, um, uh, texture isn't necessarily something that, that you'll get by spending more money and less texture by spending less money. Um, you know, there's some really nice brands of paint that have very little texture and some very cheap paints that are going to have more texture. Uh, probably the, the paint, the acrylic paint that you would find at your do local dollar store is probably what we would consider to be soft body acrylic paint, meaning it's fairly, it's, it's, it's probably a little bit more fluid than the paints that I'm using here, which are, these ones are, are closer to heavy body acrylic paints and heavy body acrylic paints are quite thick. You know, like you could take a jar of heavy body acrylic paint like this and hold it upside down. And you know, the paint is slowly moving but, you know, I'd probably have to wait another minute before it starts dripping out. You know, there's, so there's, there's paint in here. You know, it's still wet, right? Uh, but it's, it's a heavier, it's thicker. It's, it's like a toothpaste-like texture. And so it has, um, you know, uh, it, it, when it dries, it's more likely to maintain some of its density. Even though when, acrylic paint is, is probably 50-60% water. So when all that water evaporates in any acrylic paint, it's going to kind of lose its shape a little bit. Which is why artists might put... Um, So you might put some kind of a gel in here. This soft gel is going to make a little bit of a difference, but there's also heavy gel, which is, is you know, very thick, goopy kind of texture that when it dries is going to maintain the, the texture of that paint. So you can mix that in to give it more of that thickness if that's what you want. Um, but, you know, like, uh, do I have some soft body... just out of reach so you could buy, you could spend a lot of money I have really nice soft body acrylic paints back there I'm just seeing if I have any handy um, and that's that there's gonna be very little texture when I paint with them and that's something often people want is they want to paint that has has less texture if you go even further down then you get to the fluid acrylics which have much you know it's it's fluid like and if you, if you find that it's still not thin enough then you can get acrylic inks so there's kind of this scale between thickness to thinness and you could just decide how much what the viscosity level you want with your paint um so the fact that you're using those dollar store paints is not necessarily a problem it's just that 
what they're selling there is usually kind of fairly watery, soft body acrylics, which mean the likelihood of you being able to preserve the texture is very low. So, I mean, you can, you can mix all sorts of things into acrylic paint to thicken it up. I mean, artists have used all sorts of, I mean, they put sand, dirt, uh, uh, rocks, uh, we've put glitter. I mean, you can put anything in acrylic paint because acrylic paint, one of its, uh, you know, it's it has very similar chemical properties to white glue. As we've I've done all sorts of things in these episodes, gluing things to the canvas just using acrylic paint as a glue. So if you want to experiment by adding other substances into that soft body dollar store paint, you're really gonna get a lot more texture. But might not be, you know, if you're just if you want kind of texture where we see the brush strokes and unfortunately I think you're gonna to have to get a thicker paint thicker acrylic from your local art supply store hopefully that um, uh, Kent says I did try some medium with it uh, and okay so I need to look into light and heavy paints and when to use them lol <laughs> Jeannie says, mess with future archivists. Yes, absolutely. Mixing all sorts of fun. We did um, one of the Rothko paintings here. We did, I guess, a, maybe a year and a half ago, we painted a Rothko painting that looks like the Ukrainian flag. And with that one, I actually I mixed in egg whites. And I think I may even have mixed in oak, uh, egg yolks into that. M might have been just the egg whites. Because... Um, although Rothko painted with oil paints, he did use egg whites, which is actually a very ancient method of making paint, is using egg whites. Um, so yeah, you can go nuts with acrylics and putting all sorts of fun stuff in there. Okay, let me get back. Uh, yeah, maybe I think I'm ready to move on from this here, so... Now I think we're ready to just move directly into the foreground and start painting uh, Paula's self-portrait here. We can start painting her skin, her hair, and her clothes, and the flowers in her hand. So, let's see. Uh, let's take a look and think where we want to begin. What is interesting about this painting is how she is using different skin tones throughout the picture, which is very unusual. Usually when people mix a skin tone, they tend to use it everywhere. Like, like they might mix the skin tone that's on her forehead and apply it on her neck and her hands, right? Her legs, feet, whatever is visible. In this instance, she's almost treated every part of her body differently which is as I said very unusual not generally recommended but I think one of the the amazing things with uh, Paula, Paula is how she's able to make it work like it's like honestly I even when I really up until this moment looking at it, I'm like oh I didn't even I didn't even realize she did that which is kind of funny because as soon as I see it, I can't unsee it. <clears throat> so that is very, that's, that's, that is unusual. I mean, the fact that her neck is so different and this hand with a lot more orange on it than anywhere else. Okay. Um, well, okay, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the places where, like, I want to try to fill as much in here as quickly as possible. So I think what I will start by doing is, like, her, the, the blue of her, her, her clothing and this kind of the white of the collar there. 
I mean, this, this could be some sort of like a bathrobe or something she's wearing. Remember, she's quite pregnant at the time she made this painting. Probably within months of giving birth, and then sadly within months of dying uh, due to complications after uh, she gave birth to her only da daughter at age 31. So let's, uh, let's start putting in this blue here. And that blue appears to be... It's, it's a little bit of both warm and cool blue. Uh, it's, it's, uh, so it's probably the color, that blue would have been a, probably the, a cobalt blue, which was very common at the time. So let's, where should we mix this? Let's take our cool blue and <clears throat> I'll put it, mix it down here. Cool blue and warm blue. So that's pretty bright. All right, so let's take some white. Sway these side by side. So that white is going to make that very intense. Now we don't want that. That's, again, a little bit too bright. So let's take some of our black this into a bit more of a gray. I think we're getting there. Let's take a little bit of more warm blue. might be good. I, I wonder if this is going to appear darker than the original. Oh, I think it's okay. I probably could have added a little bit of glazing fluid or something in there just to make it a bit more transparent. So when I applied it with that thicker brush, notice how it went on fairly uniform. I'm using a smaller brush to go back in and paint, and that's just sort of allowing more of the brush strokes to become visible. Now, one thing um, that we want to sort of be mindful of is we don't have to completely paint in every visible, like paint right up to the lines. We may even want to keep little gaps at times in between those colors and our line work. which is very hard to, to do, to resist that urge to make it all clean and precise, like puzzle pieces that fit seamlessly together.
Okay, I'm going to blow dry that, and I might even add a little bit more white in I think I'm going to do that again. I'm going to take a bit of white. So I'm making this kind of transparent because I, I like how I can see the, um, <coughs> excuse me, I like how I can see a little bit of this brown coming through. Mine <clears throat> looks a little, you know, it's definitely lighter. Hmm. I might have put just a tad bit too much blue in there. That's okay. Let's, I'm going to move on from that and just carry on. And if I, if later on it's possible that it actually ends up being ex exactly right. That's one of the weird things with painting and with color. Sometimes you, you, I can, I, I'll just speak with myself, I can obsess over getting a color right. And I might have had it right, right at the beginning. But it appeared wrong because of the colors next to it. And then once I painted those colors that were not there yet, all of a sudden the painting, the colors that I had painted, suddenly look right again. Without me even touching them, just because the colors adjacent changed so just something to kind of keep I just always have to keep reminding myself is like just before you you know, spend hours kind of noodling in an area just get everything in there and then judge and, and see what what you think okay 
Looks great. Okay, so let's do the this kind of almost pinkish brown white on her collar there. Now that's an interesting color. So that looks like in fact let's I'm gonna zoom in. Hmm. So she's kind of got a bit of a cream going on, and then a purplish white. You can see it's very, it's not really white at all. So let's start out with, let's mix it oops, here into this brown. Cream color started. I'm gonna put a little glazing fluid in here just to help it stretch out a little bit longer and again get a little more transparency. Now, I'm going to blow dry this. Oops. And then I'm going to mix a slightly different color and paint it on top. Now, there's lots of different ways to go about doing this. Uh, but I'm just going to paint a layer over top of this rather than mix wet into wet because I've got that glazing fluid. Whenever I try to paint wet paint into glazing fluid, it drives me crazy because the paint scrapes off. So I'm just going to go a little bit slower. It's going to take a tiny bit of red, mix it into this color. I might have even just used a bit too much.
Okay, so now I'm going to take some of this paint, unmixed, and put it on my brush and try to paint a little bit with this paint, kind of mixing. bit of warm blue cool red get a bit of pink going on purple I mean So right now that seems kind of conspicuous, very kind of odd comparison to everything else. But I think once we get some of the, the rest of the painting in, in, in that particular kind of approach that she's using here, I think that's going to be more than fine. So let's now start up, um, now that we got some of that shirt, or, or, or I don't know, uh, some sort of bathrobe perhaps, or negligee, I don't know what this, that is. Let's start going in and doing some of the colors on her face, etc. So I'm going to take my warm red. I'm not even going to bother cleaning my brush. I kind of like when it gets a little bit dirty like this. Take some of that warm uh, red and warm yellow, mix it in with this white. Kind of gives me a bit, and some of that ye uh, yellow gives me a bit of a kind of a peachy color. darker peachy color uh, yeah let's stay with a bigger brush here for a second I think she's painted a little bit all over the place with this color the foreheads going to be lighter but I think she probably went in and painted a number of things with it Don't worry about painting over the your outlines at all. Let's zoom in here. <coughs> if I talk about texture. Like take a look at her the way that she painted her face. Like there's a lot of thick goopy textures right up especially in her forehead there right
And so as I said, when I, mean, I look at the rest of the painting, I don't really see the same color repeated anywhere, which is very unusual. <clears throat> okay, so... I think I want to go for this kind of golden brownish kind of color on her neck next. So let's see if we can kind of make it from scratch. It looks like we've got, I would say, predominantly warm yellow. Some warm blue. And a tiny bit of warm red. So we're talking about a color that is mostly... Uh, warm yellow. <clears throat> Can also add a tiny bit of black to that color. Okay. You know, it's similar, obviously, to our aim prematura here. But you can see that she has painted with it. So ah, I'm sorry, it's not on camera, darn it. <clears throat> I see it in this hand as well. Might be a bit in this arm. You can see where I've done all sorts of photoshopping in here. Just a tiny bit of red. Thank you. 
a tiny bit of blue into that color. Get a bit of a greenish quality going here. Let's see, looks like I need a bit more warm yellow. Be a bit too much green, but that's okay. I think I want to put this there anyway. greenish colors. I don't see it. <clears throat> you know, maybe I should do the those eyes, that little bit of kind of purpley quality in those eyes. I'm going to take my white. Uh, cool red and warm blue make a really nice purple. Obviously those are brighter than they need to be, but it's always easier to put it in there and then darken it down. Okay, let's, um, let, I'm gonna spend a little bit of a second here painting her hair, I think. You can see I'm kind of just bouncing around a little bit, <clears throat> which I love doing. I love kind of just not getting kind of stuck in one little area, just keep moving around. So I've got my warm yellow, warm red, mix warm blue into it. The more warm blue I put in here, the darker that hair is going to be. That's pretty good. I think it's going to get a bit darker. Oops. Oh, I'll, uh, a little bit later. It 
see like behind her ears here it gets really dark it kind of almost becomes a bit ambiguous as to where her hair ends and the background begins So I'm going to blow dry that and then just paint over it again to darken that hair a bit because <clears throat> it's kind of trans... Randy says, when is Michael going to have an expedition in Chicago? Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any, any immediate plans to have an exhibition in um, Chicago. Would be nice. I've never actually been to Chicago. It's on one of my... It's definitely a place that I've always wanted to go. Chicago's got one of the best art museums in the world. Try that again. Let's see, let's get a lighter, let's go back to this pink, actually, let's, I think, let's mix it again. Let's take our <clears throat> warm yellow, warm red, and white. 
my paintbrush is a little bit dirty. Again, I don't mind that. I kind of like when the brush just... My colors have a, just so many more nuances in there. It kind of gets a little bit muddy, but I love that. <clears throat> so we can use this color for... parts of her arm. more reddish one. Take a bunch of white. Mix that in there. So those pinkish colors. Let's do another one with a bunch of white. And mixing it in here. Now I'm painting with some, gosh, that looks like it needs to be a little more pinkish, doesn't it? So I'm going to paint in here with this very small brush that helps me get some of those brush strokes. Now I know they're going to be look a little bit different than hers because she painted on a larger surface with a different kind of brush. So we'll see how much of that texture makes its way through to the end of this painting.
so I just took this some of this reddish brown that I had mixed earlier and just mixing it <coughs> into my paint in order to just to get a bunch of different kinds of um, reds and pinks. Occasionally it might just take my brush, clean it off on a rag. Okay, I'm going to take a bit of cool red now. And just let a bit of that mix in, particularly around the nose. I just took a little bit of my <clears throat> uh, warm blue, mix it into that cool red. It's going to give me a bit of a purplish color, but since my paintbrush is kind of dirty, it kind of goes slightly grayish. taking a bit of gray, mixing it into this 
cold purpley uh, cold red you know it's interesting this is a different method of painting than I've it's not a particularly uncommon method of painting but it's something I haven't done in a while. I guess we just haven't looked at an artist who's used a style like this in a, for you know, recently. So for me, I love that. I love coming back and exploring different styles. It's a real challenge for me, that's for sure. So, you know, while we're doing this, just think about like uh, Paula looking in the in the mirror and changing colors, adding colors, subtracting colors, trying to get the match what she sees. So for between her lips there, taking the brown that I used for her hair and just bringing it into the same kind of muddy mixture of colors here. <clears throat> and you go, ah, it's not quite brown enough. Let's get a little more brown then. Now those color, everything looks a little bit different because we don't have her eyes painted in yet or the kind of some of the outlines that she did when she went back over top of her face. But I like how it looks right now. I'm just gonna move away from the face and start tackling other parts. Now the flowers are, are great, but I wanna, while I've still got some of these colors here I want to take advantage of them now I know I said that she one of the unique things about this painting is almost every part of her body is painted differently um, but still we it doesn't mean that the colors we've made are useless from one part to another they're still useful we just might have to modify them a little bit as we continue through the painting here 
Um, Gene says, Kent, you could try an experiment by adding a little bit of cornstarch to thicken the dollar store paint. And Kent says, that seems funny to be adding cooking supplies to paint, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's really the, the history of art supplies is very close to the history of medicine and also to food. A lot of art supplies, Art, or, you know, original painting materials are basically food. I mean, obviously, some of the pigment you put in there, like that might like cadmium red and stuff, are highly poisonous, toxic materials. But the binder, the thing that glues the paint to the surface and to its to other colors, that often is a is a plant based or some kind of organic material. Like linseed oil, for instance, is the main oil that's in most oil paints right and um so yeah i mean it all came from somewhere right so it's only acrylic paints which are essentially plastic have only been around for well i mean they were kind of synthesized in the 30s 1930s but uh really didn't become widely available until maybe the 60s you know, Andy Warhol was an early adopter of of acrylic paint, for instance, but really very few people had used it before. So it's, it's to, you know, we now think of, you know, paint as being, <clears throat> you know, you know, totally like the idea of it being there being anything edible about it is ridiculous, but that's not really the history of paint. A lot of um, paint was, again, not necessarily things you'd want to be eating, but was often made using materials that you could eat right if that makes any sense well he says really like this one um and yours looks great michael it's strange sometimes the paintings don't appeal to me much until these master studies and then i recognize their brilliance and beauty this is one of those awesome i love that um yeah you know i'm i i really like how this one's turning out that face I'm almost tempted just to leave it like that. Obviously, there's you know the outlines are gonna bring it together. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it appears on camera, but here in person, it looks pretty cool. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the hands. <clears throat> and so here we've got uh, browns and oranges, less kind of peachy pink colors. So. Um, that means basically not as much blue in these colors. So we're going to take our warm yellow, with warm red. And then as I go introducing a little bit of white. I may even come back with a bit stronger orange in a little bit. We'll see. All right, so I just have my orange here. Now just taking a bit of white, putting more and more white into this color. So for some people, they may really like this approach to painting, uh, where we're using a lot, just sort of 
we see all the brush strokes. She's not trying to hide anything here. She's very transparent about where those brush strokes are. Now, I should say that really most, like, <clears throat> that part of the painting where I'm covering uh, does not exist in the original. The original painting is very narrow. <coughs> so we can use our imaginations to, to decide what, how we want to kind of paint the rest of this hand, this arm. And there's no one who can say it doesn't actually look like that. So, uh, towards that end, I'm just going to start to kind of put in a bunch of wet paint here. <clears throat> and then I'm going to kind of paint into it. It's a little bit like the way an oil painter might work. <clears throat> okay, I think that's okay for now. I'm going to move on to the other hand. Um, which again, that, so there's a lot of orange here. In fact, that orange has almost no white in there. So let's take our warm yellow. I'm going to mix it separately here.
a little bit more warm red into this orange <clears throat> in some places. I'm just going to dig into some of these pre-mixed colors that I had there earlier <clears throat> and just kind of paint them I think I need to modify or just add some texture to her neck.
And then this is great. I love being able to come back. <clears throat> okay, so let's zoom back in. Now that I got so much kind of paint on here and I got a bunch of different colors all wildly mixed all over my palette, <clears throat> I can then uh, use all those kind of slightly different colors to really be very playful. Okay, those flowers, let's motor ahead here. <clears throat> okay, take our cool blue and cool red, mostly cool red. I'll just take a little bit of white <coughs> into that same mixture. I'll let both of those dry. The insides of them are kind of like warm red, almost this orange. So let's take my warm orange, same kind of orange I was using for the hands earlier. Maybe it's time to paint the, the stems of the uh, flowers there. So what color is that? That is, I think it's mostly a cool yellow, cool blue. Maybe a bit of, tiny bit of black in there. <clears throat> uh, a bit more. So 
let's see. <clears throat> So that's very saturated. I'm going to add a bit of white, though. Um, I'm just going to make it go a little bit teal. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe, actually, I'll add even a little bit of black into that. Kind of a grayish green color. Although you know what, that maybe that's too much. Let's let's do that again. Take a bit of that gray, not as much though. So the reason why I added some white to this green <clears throat> is in order to try to give it a good foundation so I can paint a more saturated green over top of it. I'm going to blow dry this here now. Uh, uh, Kent says, I want to taste some old paintings now. <laughs> Yummy. Well, he says, it looks awesome on camera, too. You could easily leave the face pretty much as it is. Captures the essence of the original perfectly. In my opinion, you're so talented, Michael. You can do anything. Uh, <laughs> well, he says, I personally love Picasso for breakfast and Da Vinci for dinner. And Kent says, now let's just let Michael's age over 100 years and it'll match perfectly. Let those colors dull a little. <laughs> <coughs> you guys are very, very sweet. I appreciate that. Okay, let's go back to our green here. So I'm, now that I've used that one, it's got some white. Let's take one where there's little to no white at all. <coughs> and let's get a much more saturated green. I'm going to take this very saturated green. It's almost on the edge of too much, but And um, now I'm going to take a little bit of warm blue, mix it into that same green. Warm blue is going to darken this green.
So I'm just, I'm adding warm blue to that green to darken it, rather than just relying on black. I mean, I could use black, but I always prefer to use a color rather than just use black. This gives a little more nuance. <clears throat> Oh, you know what, that well, green. I'm gonna take a bit of this green that I actually made and I put a bunch of white into it. I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna put it in a couple of little places where she's also used it. Maybe put some in the eye there. doesn't quite work so well, but I'm going to take a little bit of warm yellow. She's got a bit of this. Hmm, that might not have been the most appropriate color, but... Okay, <clears throat> close, close. Um, okay, let's, uh, I'm gonna zoom out here. I think it's time to do some So we're getting close to the end here. Really just some outlining, little bit of fish fishing, little bit of finishing touches before we wrap up. Maybe darkening in the hair potentially or maybe not. It all depends on how some of that outlining goes here. So um, let's take a look at the original and just think about where we want to start. Um, I might s start down here and then work my way upward. Uh, that way I can kind of build up maybe confidence with outlining before I tackle the main part of the face, right? I see Kent made a donation through the super chat function. Thanks so much, Kent. I really appreciate that. Very 
cool. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so, um, let's, I think we're, we're going to be using mostly black. Alright, so here's this black that I made right near the beginning. Well, there is a little bit of white mixed in accidentally. I just did that. Not necessarily a bad thing, because we don't necessarily want a lot of black everywhere. <clears throat> but I may have to, to mix up a, a darker black <laughs> at some point. Definitely a little gray. It's an interesting choice of hers to draw paint her hands at the bottom of the picture they're on her belly so big and I think that's you know probably she's just suggesting that you know those hands appear closer to us and also big because her belly is big she's you know, like probably seven months pregnant or something by this point So I'm trying to let the brush be kind of dry so that it's not super bold.
So it's sort of like a little bit of a dry brush technique. And if you've never used a dry brush, <clears throat> then you know a little bit of what I'm doing is I get a bit of paint on my brush, and then I just sort of take a little bit, oops, take a little bit off. I kind of sometimes just brush a little bit. And that way when I do paint, there's not a big a lot of paint, is my brush is kind of dry, hence dry brush technique. Uh, it's a technique that is from China in originally. And they were the absolute masters of the dry brush technique because it is tricky. You'll find that sometimes you, you do it and more paint squeaks off the brush than you expect and that can be kind of frustrating. <clears throat> so, if that happens, don't be too surprised. There's Goodman in the chat. Hello, good man. <laughs> Let's proceed up here. Okay. Her chin. That's kind of tricky. I'm doing everything possible to restrain myself from doing too much. So just remember, if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world, All right? If you have to kind of go back and make a change or anything, it's okay. So my, my paintbrush is just sort of just barely touching the surface and just letting it kind of just delicately touch the surface there.
generally with bottom eyelids you just want to be fairly subtle Her eyes have got kind of a slightly grayish blue. So I have this grayish blue that I made for her jacket ages ago. <clears throat> I'm going to put that in place here. Take my black, come back into here. I like how it, I might have to let that dry. I like how she's almost sort of got like a, a little spiral or something going on here. So let's sort of blow dry. Goodman says, question, are chat donations the best way to, or sorry, that's Kent says, are, are the best way to support your art? I thank you so much for the question. I really appreciate that. Um, so chat, uh, if you, when you donate through the YouTube super chat, I think YouTube takes like 40% of whatever you donate um, versus if you send it something through PayPal, I think it's, um, it's like $1.00. Uh, plus like one percent or something of the donation fee. So if you uh, if you're interested in donating and you want uh, Me to receive the the majority of your donation then donating through PayPal is your best option or, or e-transfer both of those work very well um, So I do appreciate this YouTube super chat, but of course YouTube takes a good chunk of that away um, So but whatever's easiest, I do appreciate uh, any support for sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, Goodman says, hello, Mr. Markowski. How are you and how was your days? I was completing learning drawing from your free course today. Wow, did you finish the whole course? You did all 45 episodes? I did 45 episodes of that? That's a, that's a huge achievement. That is great. Uh, I don't know if you've put any stuff up on the Facebook group, uh, but I would love to see your drawings on the Facebook group and chat about them and um, to help inspire other people to do that um, course as well. Great job. Well done, Goodman. Very proud of you. Well done. Okay, so almost done this painting.
keeps looking at this, trying to think of, <clears throat> do I want to do any more outlining on that face? I don't know. I might be, I might be at the, the end of that. Uh, let's take some of this black. Okay, I'm going to add <clears throat> a little bit of glazing fluid to this black. Just so that I can go over and darken it. like from a little bit further away. <clears throat> hmm. And what else could be done? Goodman says, uh, I haven't completed the course. I've done 10 videos so far. 10 videos, 20 hours. <laughs> awesome. That's a commitment for sure. It's hard to do it all by yourself too. Like that's, that's, you know, highly, you know, I'm a big admirer for sure. Well done. Okay. I'm almost done. Almost done. This, speaking of finishing things up. I just want to make uh, one of those flowers a little bit more purple.
So, you know, I'm looking at this and I see areas where I could dark, at least on camera, I could darken a bunch of things. Like her face in here. I don't know how much of that I want to do, though. I'm pretty content with where this painting is at. The other thing, too, is her hand, <clears throat> you know, how do I want to do anything there? Let's just get a bit more orange on there. She's got this pretty fierce orange. <clears throat> now the only thing I feel like is maybe her clothing doesn't quite match texturally to everything else that's going on I am tempted to do stuff in here but it might also just be one of the things where I should just call it a day and walk away. I, d I think probably I'm the only one who will care about that or notice those differences. 
and usually when that's the case, it's it might it's advisable just to let it be. <clears throat> now, do anything in the forehead? Is that too light? Maybe just a little bit. Right, so I'm just kind of scraping into the dregs of my paint here, rather than trying to mix something up. And also, I like that because I end up getting kind of really neat little mixtures. Obviously, it's going to make it would make my life, you know, terrible to try to mix any of those colors a second time. But I like. All this looks pretty dry. I'm just seeing any, anything still oh, functional around here. Yeah, I think that might be good. Okay. So. It's time for our side-by-side -side comparison to check out how we did today. Um, and see if there's anything that I could have done a little bit differently. Uh, before we do so, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. 70% or sometimes actually a little more than that of people who watch this channel are not subscribers. So even if, you know, an extra 5% of the people who watch these videos turned into subscribers, it would change my life overnight. And I'd be able to do this all the time. I wouldn't have to do anything else but make videos all day long, every day, right? Uh, so, if you want to support the channel, speaking of which is small donation, then you consider leaving one through PayPal, the Super Chat while we're live, or if you want to send an e-transfer or a letter in the mail, you can contact me through my email. My email's on my website and the Facebook group. All those links are down below. So let's take a look at how we did. There's the original, and then there's my version next to it. Um, I think it looks pretty good. Again, I, it's ha always hard for me to tell how it looks on camera. When I look at mine and then I look at the, the computer screen, I'm like, yeah, actually, that's that's pretty much what I see. Um, but then I look at the preview going out to the internet and I'm like, hmm, it always looks a little different. Uh, you know, I didn't get quite as much texture on mine as hers. I really love the amount of texture she has on in hers. Uh, but it's a little bit harder to do that on such a small surface that I'm painting on. Uh, so how about let's let's uh, let's kind of zoom in here. And speaking of texture, let's take a close look at these. And maybe even before we go right to the face, let's just kind of go down and. Look at things like, let's say, this hand over here. So, you know, again, so much of really the majority, like basically where I have my hand did not exist. The original painting is very narrow. So all of this is just from my imagination, 
right? And you could see here on all of this Photoshop work, that's actually, there's the edge of the original right there. So everything to the left of that cursor is my invention. And you can see it looks kind of weird and blurry. <clears throat> that's why. Look at that hand. It is odd, and also, too, there's only two fingers visible in the original. So there's the, the uh, line dividing it, the bottom of the canvas is somewhere down there. So not only have I added a second finger, I've got a third finger in view here. Uh, I, one of the things I think is, in, is interesting and maybe odd is how she didn't do a fingernail on that thumb. Uh, and so I originally painted one, and then I painted it out, and I actually kind of like how it's just semi-visible underneath the paint. I think that, for me, satisfies that that's a thumb, and that there's something there, but it was deliberately chosen to be kind of, some, kind of omitted, I guess. Let's look at the other side, this other arm. Again, the original painting, I think, ends right through here i think everything to the right of my cursor is uh stuff that i've photoshopped in so if we kind of think about basically to the right of my hand is all my own invention that's why you get all these weird artifacts there where i'm using the clone stamp to stamp things in uh you know again i deliberately let this get you know, very dry um, and a little ragged, a little bit of that dry brush technique that she used throughout this painting, rather than making a big solid line there. Right? I think that's kind of important to her technique is she's not just outlining everything. She lets um, the paint sort of overlap onto those areas, which gives it a bit of like a... Um, uh, there's, it, it suggests that there's like a speed of, of movement of brush strokes that is very seductive. You know, I'm maybe the least happy with the way that I did the clothes. You know, I, I, I later adapted to being, to actually painting wet into wet later on, as opposed to doing layers of paint so that I could get those, the paint kind of smearing and blending together. So... But that's, you know, that is one reason why I, um, that, that's a reason why I kind of like painting some of those areas before going to the skin. Because, you know, people probably aren't going to be noticing the clothing. That's not the first part of the painting they're going to look at. So those are areas where I can problem solve, knowing that they're, you know, I would like it if people looked at the whole painting. But if there's areas where I know they're going to get less consideration, then that's a good place for me to try things out until I can get it. And then when I get it, I can do that on the places that I know people are going to look at closely. Like, for instance, people, whenever there's a face in a painting, especially eyes, the human brain always wants to look at the eyes. So those are the areas I usually try to do last once I've built up my confidence once I've sort of figured like I've got a, understood a little bit of that artist technique then that's where I'll, I'll put those finishing touches in because I feel more confident in those areas uh, but again it's, I don't think it's that big of a deal <clears throat> okay let's look at this hand I love the way she painted that hand and it doesn't quite come across on mine you know it could be a little you know mine is more defined I love how kind of goopy and gummy all of this is. All that kind of, you know, toothpaste globs of paint. I think it's really cool. Mine looks certainly a lot more flat. You know, I defined it with those. I even tried to be pretty, you know, hands off. Pun not intended, but I guess is okay. Um, with my black outlining, trying to keep that to a minimum. And even then, you can see it, it feels more defined than hers like the, those kind of little gray lines in there i think are really nice uh the kind of the flowers i feel like are fine i think that they turned out you know as, as well as i might have wanted i um no complaints there uh just quickly you know the her neck 
that was a little bit tricky trying to get that kind of golden brown color is that that's a very difficult color to mix um you know it's mostly warm yellow and and kind of a mustardy brown uh but you know it's it, it's but yeah it's just a little bit tricky to get uh, I think it's basically like a warm brown with a little bit of black into it. Uh, but you got to be careful because the black is going to dull the color very quickly. And then we'll kind of just zoom into the face. Uh, my colors, everything looks a little bit brighter on camera because I have boosted the brightness of the camera settings. So it's not quite as bright as that in person. Um, but it is probably still an extra 5% brighter anyway. I think it looks fine like that. I'm, I'm happy with the way that looks. And then also, I guess we didn't really talk about the background here yet. So let's just take a look at this. I think I got the colors pretty close. I think I got the blue originally really well done. And then I glazed over top of it with this kind of a um, orangey uh, brown. And the first one I did really brought out the green. So I, uh, and that's what we see here, this kind of greenish color. Again, it's very, it's almost impossible to see with the naked eye on camera, it's, it's more visible. So then I kind of changed tactics and rather I kind of mixed a, a brown that was red and blue dominant and painted that in. And then that got a little bit more of, of this brownish quality that I wanted. see some of that aim premature coming through at the top I don't mind that like sometimes I like those that little bit of a trail of evidence or something for anyone who's curious enough to try to do what I was just doing kind of reverse engineering these paintings and trying to think about how the artist got from A to B so you know sometimes those are kind of nice little little clues to the someone from the future uh, again, now, this whole part of the painting does not exist in the original. So how big her shoulder is, how it curved, you know, there's no, you know, we, we have no idea because it wasn't included in the original painting. So you can't really go wrong here determining, uh, you know, does it have a pointier shoulder like I kind of photoshopped or a rounder shoulder? Or does it even matter, is the question. <clears throat> so, one last time, looking at these two portraits of this incredible artist. Side by side. I like that one. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan of her work. And I'm so glad that uh, she's being reappraised and taking her rightful place within uh, the history of modern art. Um, very cool. Okay, everyone, thanks for painting along with me. I'm tr what are we doing next week? Oh, next week we're finishing our Raphael painting, um, the Sistine Madonna. And then I think the week after, we're doing a Michelangelo, the the uh, Donny Tondo. And then we're doing a Donatello. And then we're doing a Last Supper painting for Easter. But it's not by Da Vinci. So we're doing, we're, but we are going to do a Da Vinci painting in March. So we're going to get all of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Raphael, Leonardo, Donatello, and Michelangelo. Uh, we're going to get through all of them, but I got a little um, surprise for The Last Supper. Another Renaissance painter that you may or may not have heard of before, who, who was, again, another female artist who was lost to history that um, I'm so excited to share with you because I think she her version might be better than Leonardo's. So... We'll talk all about that when we get there. We'll see you guys very soon. Have a wonderful week. Continue painting wherever you are on our planet. The more paintings and art and things that you make, the more that you're inspiring, 
the people in your community to follow their own passions and dreams and the more beautiful world we will live in. Uh, so thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you again very soon. Have a great night. Bye-bye.